Facebook's always slow. My video, let's see. It didn't want to go live automatically. It's weird. It says automatically going live at 7.30. Uh, well, um, it's weird. All right, give me a moment to see what's going on over here. <laughs> Um, hmm. maybe it is live. I don't see it. Facebook like keeps changing. Oh, it is live. Okay. Facebook keeps changing how to run this. It drives me nuts. Um, but as we'll learn today, life is not meant to be easy. What can I say? So let me share this over here. And I even brought a laptop this time so it could be quicker to share. Um, so I can, I can share out both. Share, share now, public. Okay. All right. So we're all shared out. And um, close this. All right. So we're now ready to start the class. Let me just. All right. All right, so thank you to all those who joined us, whether you're on Zoom or you're on Facebook. It's good to see you all. And um, today we have a very interesting topic, but first we have a very non-interesting joke um, because I don't say good jokes. So the joke goes like this. Do you want to hear a joke about paper? It's terrible. Okay, all right, that was terrible. That wasn't a real joke for the class, but I have to introduce it at least first with a really bad joke. Um, so the joke goes like this, um, uh, a kid comes to his dad and says, dad, can you tell me how much it costs to get married? And the father says, son, tell you the truth. I don't know. I'm still paying. Um, so what does that mean? Um, it's expensive. You get married, you have kids, everything. It's a lifelong cost. And in a sense uh, taking it down now more seriously is in Judaism, in Judaism, um, it's very, very expensive to live a, a Jewish life. Um, we spend, um, let's say, every Shabbat, you have to spend extra money to make a nice meal. You know, a lot of people, their big dinner year is Thanksgiving or, or New Year's or whatever. But yes, we have this big meal every single Shabbat. But let's put that aside. Just let's take the last month, the holiday month. So came Rosh Hashanah, you had to spend money to doing a Rosh Hashanah dinner. Then it came uh, Yom Kippur. You had to eat before and eat afterwards and pay for a hotel room. And then you have to pay some, some money to your synagogue and actually multiple times because there's, there's a drive for Rosh Hashanah. Then there's a drive for Yom Kippur. And then there's the last day of Sukkot. You have to give every day of Sukkot. It's like every day there's a reason to give charity in the, in the holidays. And then you have to buy a little of an etro. And then there's options. You get the 35, 45, 105. Then you have to buy your sukkah, and every year you need new things for your sukkah. I'm telling you, it's not it's not like a one and done. You buy the sukkah. This year it needs new lights. Next year it needs a new AC. Uh, if anybody figures out the AC in Florida, let me know. So it, it's kind of, um, and then you have all the holiday meals, and so, um, and you have to buy your your rabbi gifts, and you have to buy your family gifts. And this is not even including all the time that it takes, especially this year, the holidays, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, Judaism is both expensive and time and effort. There's nothing that's easy about it. Uh, well, there are easy things about it. It's nice, but, but it's not easy. That's for sure. Uh, there's, there's an old Yiddish play by uh, Shalom Aleichem. He says, uh, good evening, and he says, uh, how, how tough is it to be a Jew? It's a famous Yiddish line. People say, uh, it's so hard to be a Jew. And um, I guess, it, you know, if you watch Fiddler on the Roof, that's kind of what they want to present too. And it just doesn't look too easy to be Jewish. So the question is, and this is a question that people ask me in different words. If God wanted me to keep this, if God wanted me to do this, um, why didn't he make it any easier? In other words, if God really wants me to keep Shabbat, he should make keeping Shabbos earlier. If God wanted me to keep the holidays, he should make keeping the holidays earlier. 
In fact, I have a text here. I'm going to pull, I'm not going to put it up on the screen, but somebody sent me the other day. He writes, uh, when will I ever get to truly serve God? What is God? Why does God allow this to happen to me if I desire to praise him? Okay, so he was asking, you know, why, why do I have such difficulties in my life and it's so hard to keep it? And uh, if God really wants me to keep it, he should roll out the red carpet. If he really wants me to keep Shabbat, roll out the red carpet. If he really wants me to keep the holidays, have my business shut on Tuesday and Wednesday. If he really wants to keep Shabbat, make uh, Sundays my busiest day of the week. This is a question that sometimes we verbalize, sometimes we, we don't. Uh, I think everybody asks this question of themselves at different points in their life, especially when Judaism gets very difficult at different times. Uh, it's not always a smooth ride, an easy ride. And so today we're going to explore um, why it is that Judaism is not easy and why it's so expensive in other ways and, um, and that it's specifically meant to be that way. So we're going to start off with a discussion surrounding a very difficult mitzvah. So there's one mitzvah that's discussed in this week's Torah portion that's very difficult, and we make a very big deal out of it. Does anybody know what it is? You can put in the chat or wherever. There's one mitzvah discussed in this week's Torah portion that's not easy. Um, do you know what it is? Uh, let me just, oh, I'm here myself twice. Anybody knows what it is? If you're on Facebook, you can put in the chat too. Anybody? No? Okay. Brit Milah, the circumcision. The circumcision is in this week's Torah portion. And uh, I'm sure you know circumcision in any case is not easy. Um, but in this week, we have a very difficult case of circumcision. And that is uh, Abraham. Abraham, in this week's Torah portion, was a very old man when he was circumcised. Let's read over here the uh, Torah portion. This is from Bereshit. Avram was 99 years old. God appeared to Avram and said, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. God said to Avraham. Well, they just spelled Avraham three times differently. Avram, Avram, Avraham. Okay, I won't get into that. Uh, Keep my covenant, you and your progeny after you throughout the generations. This is my covenant that you shall observe between me and you and your progeny after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Circumcise the flesh of your skin. It shall be a sign of covenant between me and you. At age of eight days old. And so we're lucky that uh, typically we get circumcised at eight days old. Some other religions do at 13. Then it ends off. Avraham was 99 years old when the flesh of his foreskin was circumcised. So uh, Abraham did not have it easy. Uh, we make a big deal out of this mitzvah. We discuss it a lot. Abraham was 99 years old when he had his circumcision. Now, to be fair, Abraham did live to, able, to age 175. So 99 wasn't 99 of today, but it's still not young. He's more than halfway through his life. And so the question is, why is there a need for such a difficult mitzvah? Uh, why does God give us such a difficult mitzvah as circumcision? Till today, it's one of the most difficult things. Uh, there's big movements against circumcision in many different places. Um, I remember um, I, I once went to speak to a group of Russian Jews. And they're like, why does God have to make circumcision? Maybe he should make it, you take a little piece off your nose, he said. He's like, well, why make it so difficult? You know, make it to come off your nose or something which I, I, maybe he didn't like his long Jewish nose. I'm not sure, but um, okay. <laughs> but why, and, and I'll ask differently, if God wanted us to be circumcised, why make it difficult? Just make us born circumcised. Make us born circumcised. That would, that would alleviate any issues. So let's take a look here. Very interesting Midrash. So the Midrash here says, a philosopher asked Rabbi Hosea, he said to him, if God loves circumcision, why did he not give it to Adam? He said to him, anything created in the first six days needs further actions. For example, mustard seeds need sweetening, peas need sweetening, weeds need sweetening, even humans need fixing. What he really means in a, like the translation is, um, why is he not born circumcised? And the answer is that anything that's created in the first six days needs to be fixed, right? So just as 
you have peas, you need to cook them, right? God doesn't grow pre-cooked peas, you need to cook them. Uh, wheat doesn't grow ground, you need to grind it. Uh, human beings are not necessarily created perfect and we need to be fixed. So what he's answering is, is that everything in this world is not created perfect. You need to do the work, you need, you need to fix it. So, so the people were not born perfect, but that doesn't explain why, that just is telling us a fact. Okay, so the metrics is telling us a fact. Um, why is it difficult? Well, everything in life is difficult is pretty much the answer. Nothing comes easy. You want wheat, you want bread, you gotta grow the wheat and then you gotta grind it and then you gotta bake it. You want a circumcision, God's not gonna make it easy. You gotta, you gotta circumcise yourself. But the question is, so why, why is it difficult? In other words, we, we understand, okay, so we're saying it just like everything else in life is not easy, so mitzvahs are not easy, but we didn't explain why either of them are not easy. So to answer that, we will change topics a little bit. Oh, I went out of focus over there, sorry. So to, to answer this, we're gonna change topics a little bit and we're gonna discuss um, something unique about circumcision. There's something unique about circumcision. And what I mean by that is, uh, I'm sure you all know circumcision is a big deal in Judaism. We make a big deal out of it. And in fact, out of Abraham, uh, out of Abraham's circumcision, we make a big deal out of it. We spend a lot of time in the Torah talking about a circumcision. What's interesting is Abraham kept all the mitzvahs of the Torah. Okay, uh, we know from the Talmud. The Talmud says that Abraham sat in the study hall and he learned. Isaac sat in the study hall and learned. And Jacob sat. In the... Our forefathers and, and, and our patriarchs and matriarchs they knew all of the commandments of the Torah. So presumably they were keeping the commandments of the Torah. So why did we make a big deal out of circumcision and not anything else? Now, I won't even get into the discussion why didn't Abraham get circumcised before God commanded him? It's a lengthier discussion. But, you know, I think just as the Torah makes a big deal out of Abraham um, uh, circumcising, I think we should also make a big deal out of Abraham preparing for Passover. How about that one? That's a big one, right? Abraham. Abraham, I want you to clean your kitchen of all the dough and, and discusses Abraham throwing out all his pots and pans and his back aching and, and driving to the car wash and cleaning his car and checking with the candle and then eating matzah. Like you can make a big deal out of other things. What? It seems like this is the only mitzvah that Abraham does that we make a big deal out of. Everything else we talk in generalities. When the Torah talks about Abraham, how he was righteous, just as Abraham walked with God, he followed God, he listened to God. Even the 10 tests of Abraham, we don't enumerate all of them in the Torah, actually. There's one main one that's really focused on the binding of Isaac. So why is it that out of all the mitzvahs that Abraham did, we focus on the circumcision and not any of the others? So to answer, so there's a very fascinating answer in Hasidic philosophy. Hasidic philosophy says the reason why we focus on circumcision is because circumcision is unique. So again, the question is, uh, taking the premise that Abraham knew all the commandments, why is the Torah, and, and presumably tried to keep them, why does the Torah make a big deal out of circumcision versus any other commandment that he does, let's say, Passover? And the answer is, very fascinatingly, that uh, the Torah makes a big deal out of circumcision because circumcision is a big deal. I know it sounds funny, but again, the Torah makes a big deal out of circumcision because circumcision is a big deal. Circumcision is a very unique mitzvah amongst the mitzvahs that Abraham did. Let me backtrack a little bit. The reason why the Torah tells us about our, our patriarchs and matriarchs' lives is because their lives come reflected into our lives, okay? It's not just, the Torah is not a book of history when you think about it. It goes through a lot of history very quickly. Uh, the reason why it focuses on the patriarchs and matriarchs, and it doesn't even talk about all the details of the life, only certain details of the life, is because those details are very relevant to our lives. And so the fact that the Torah spends so much time discussing Abraham's circumcision, that means it must be relevant to our lives. Now you could say, well, it's irrelevant because we, we do circumcision too. Well, we do, if he kept Passover, we do Passover too, right? So why the big deal out of circumcision? And the answer is because circumcision contains something unique, which later down, which later on, circles into how we do our mitzvahs. So again, circumcision has something unique to it, which has a closer relationship to the mitzvahs that we do. So let's read over here. 
Hasidic philosophy explains that the mitzvah of circumcision fulfilled by Abraham had an advantage over the other mitzvahs he fulfilled. The other mitzvahs fulfilled by Abraham had two disadvantages. One, he did them on his own accord. Two, the mitzvahs did not have the power to permeate the physical objects used to fulfill them and invest them with sanctity. The mitzvahs we do today after God gave us the Torah are advantageous in both areas. God, one, God commanded us to do them. Two, they instill sanctity within the objects used to fulfill them so that the physical becomes sacred. And again, I'm going to read these, this, this paragraph again because it's important. The mitzvahs we do today after God gave us the Torah are advantageous in both areas. A, God commanded us to do them. B, they instill sanctity within the objects used to fulfill them so that the physical becomes sacred. So what are we saying over here? God commanded, God did command or didn't command. What's the difference? You honor your parents. Uh, you keep pace up. You were commanded, you weren't commanded. B, what does it mean? They could instill, they couldn't instill sanctity. So let me explain. Um, Hasidic philosophy explains that before the giving of the Torah, um, you could not make a physical object holy, right? So if I were to ask you, is this pen holy right now? You'd say probably not. But if I were to grab another physical object that's sitting here, let's say a mezuzah, okay? That's a piece of paper and ink, okay? That's a piece of paper and ink. You'd say, wow, that's, that's holy. Let's, let's treat that with respect. Um, if I were to show you a laptop bag, say, is that holy? You'd say, not really holy. I show you a tefillin bag. You'd say, wow, that's, that's something holy. So we take for granted today that we take physical items and they become holy. They become spiritual. They become special. But that's because we live in a post- giving of the Torah era. Uh, we are told that before the giving of the Torah, the spiritual and the physical did not mesh. You could not mix something physical and spiritual. In other words, you could not take a physical object and make the holy. When you think about it for a second, it's a little crazy. Like just because I did something holy with this suddenly it becomes holy. I have to treat it with respect. I have to honor it. Um, today, in fact, today's society has the opposite type of feeling. I'll give you the greatest example. Cremation. Uh, cremation is very popular today. Cremation is in essence saying when something is useful, it's useful. When it's done its usefulness, then we can burn it, get rid of it in any way. We don't have to treat it with respect. That's ultimately what cremation is saying it is now that the, the body is dead, we, we can just burn it. We can dispose of it. Um, that's a very physical outlook in life. In Judaism, we say, no, there's a sanctity to the body. It retains its sanctity. But it's a radical idea when you think about it to take a physical object and say that this has changed forever. And before the giving of the Torah, that was not possible. You could not, the physical and the spiritual were separate. And so we're actually told when it says that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the patriarchs and matriarchs did the commandments of the Torah before the giving of the Torah, they did it mostly in a very spiritual plane. So, and the physical objects were just symbols but they weren't actually the the holiness of the they weren't actually the holiness of the mitzvah so uh for example to fill in they wouldn't necessarily bind themselves with physical to fill in they they they, they did the spiritual mitzvah of to fill in and the same thing with all other things that's actually why uh, most of our patriarchs and matriarchs they if they work they worked in a they worked they were shepherds it says why were they shepherds shepherds they don't have to work the land they, they they can you know let the sheep run around and 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 think and pray and connect to god all day um but today um your physical action can change the item in fact one of the phone calls i get very often is rabbi i have these old uh, holy books in my house i need to dispose of i need to bring them to you you need to bury it whatever whatnot we don't just throw out papers of torah uh we bury them but how do we have this ability? How can we take spirituality and infuse it into something physical, right? Many religions, uh, or, or, you know, if you go to uh, certain places, um, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of their life is about meditation and escaping the reality, um, escaping the physicality. How is it that we can actually change the physical properties of a 
physical object to make it holy? And the answer is only God can do it. If God commands you in a mitzvah, now you can take a physical object and make it holy. So again, if God commands you, God has the ability to merge physical and spiritual. God has that power. He can merge the physical and the spiritual. And so that's what was unique about the mitzvah of circumcision. It was the only mitzvah that Abraham was commanded. And it was also the only mitzvah where something physical became spiritual. Abraham was elevated as a person when he did the circumcision. But it was the first time that he was elevated as a person, not just a person who lives a spiritual life, but could he could actually elevate himself. And that's why we focus on the Brit Milah and the circumcision, because that mitzvah trickles down to us. Nowadays, we live in a post-giving of the Torah, where all the mitzvahs that we do are commanded by God, and we can instill any object with spirituality. We can take anything and make it holy. So in this pen, in a sense, I can kind of make it holy. There are levels in holiness, but by using it to write Torah thoughts, I've elevated the ink that's now on my paper over here, right? I've elevated all my notes. I've elevated it. Um, you can take headphones, listen to a Torah class. You can elevate all these things that are around you. There's different levels in elevation, but you can elevate the world around you. And that is why uh, we focus on circumcision, because circumcision is the forerunner and the first mitzvah that really leads to our mitzvahs. Remember how I said earlier, any... Uh, uh, any mitzvah, any story told about our forefathers is told, uh, uh, patriarchs and mitzvahs is told to us because it, it has a connection to what we do today. Well, that's the same thing with Brit Milah. The reason why that mitzvah, not Passover, is told to us because when Abraham did Passover, he was not commanded to do Passover. He decided to do it by himself. He was not able to elevate the matzah. He was not able to elevate his home, the physical items around him. But the circumcision... That is the most related to our mitzvahs. And that's why it's an important mitzvah, uh, important to read about for men and women, because it really is the forerunner of all the mitzvahs that all of us do today. They all have that same element within it. And so that's why circumcision is a big deal. Um, but now we need to get back to our original point. Um, so what we've said till now, so just to summarize in this section, is we wanted to know why does Judaism make such a big deal out of Abraham's circumcision? Why not the other things that he's done? And the answer is that um, that is the only mitzvah where he, where he literally was a forerunner to our mitzvahs, where we are both commanded by God and we can instill the items with sanctity. And both of those items are related. Because we are commanded by God, therefore we have the ability to instill the items of sanctity. In other words, God commanding us means that he's creating that fusion of the physical and the spiritual. Um, the, the Midrash actually gives an example of like the separation of, of uh, spiritual and physical. It gives us, I guess, an example. You could say it's like the Berlin Wall, you know, West Berlin and East Berlin. It was saying they're separate. There was no connection between them. You couldn't put them together. If you look actually in the Torah, for the most part, the holy people were holy and the non-holy people were not holy. In other words, you didn't have people going from side to side. This is actually a class I gave on Shabbos. But if you look at the Torah, like the generation from Adam until uh, Noah, either you were very righteous, like Enoch, it says he walked with God and he disappeared. He was too holy for this world. Or you were wicked, wicked. There was no, you couldn't have people like us today where we're like a mixture. We, we can't figure out if we're holy, we're not holy. Um, Back in the day, before the giving of the Torah, you're either very holy or very wicked. There was, it was a hard time to mesh being spiritual and being physical. Joseph, really, in a sense, was also the first, was also a forerunner for what we do. Joseph was kind of the first guy to really live in the world and yet be a spiritual person. That's also why the Torah makes a big deal out of Joseph, because, again, he's the forerunner to how we live today, to be able to live in this world and nevertheless be a spiritual uh, minded person. And so again, we see everything the Torah decides to tell us is because that's really important to how we live our lives today. They're not just stories of old, but they're important lessons of how we live our life today. So now let's get back to our original question. We asked, why doesn't Judaism come easy? Well, based upon what we said, um, hopefully it will now become a little bit clear. Uh, so let me share the screen over here. We'll read some text over here. 
Um, one of the aspects of the mitzvot performed today after God gave us the Torah is that we must endeavor to perform them in a natural manner, not a miraculous one. Since the mitzvot must refine the physical objects of the natural world and invest them with sanctity, they should be performed in a way that conforms with the nature so that instead of overriding nature, it will be refined. So what does that mean? Miracles are cool. Miracles are awesome. Miracles are splendid. But a miracle also means that you don't really have proper control. What do I mean? If the only way I can get my kids to listen is by picking them up and putting them in place and pick, right? They don't want to eat. So I pick up the kid. I sit them down in the seat. I forcibly open up their mouth and I stick a food into their mouth, right? I've gotten them to eat. But do I really have control? Am I really changing that child? Not at all. I've overridden it, but nothing's really changed over there. So when God has to take us out of Egypt, the miracles, oh, so cool. The miracles are so cool. But in a sense, it's also a letdown that, that Pharaoh did not naturally of himself decide to let the Jewish people go. Pharaoh, we couldn't change the Pharaoh, so we had to do a miracle. But what would have been greater is if Pharaoh himself would have decided to change. Um, so similarly, over here, when we want to do a mitzvah, could God make it super easy every time you want to keep Shabbos? Your boss comes over and says, you know what? I really love it that you want to keep the Shabbos. I'm going to give you a bonus over here for keeping the Shabbos. I think that would be, right? That would be great. That would be like, wow, right? That would be amazing. God, God can make that happen, right? Um, but he doesn't do that. Typically, God doesn't do that typically. It, it's meant to be hard to keep Shabbos. It's meant to be hard to keep the holidays. It's meant to be hard to do all of this because that means we're actually changing the physical world, which is the ultimate purpose. Remember, we're trying to make a, a fusion of spiritual and physical. In order to make that fusion, the physical has to remain physical. If you override it, if it becomes too easy, you're not changing it. So since nature, since naturally life is not easy, mitzvahs are also not going to be easy. Nothing in life is easy. And so a mitzvah is also not going to be easy. If it was too easy, you wouldn't be changing nature. You'd be having a miracle. And miracles don't change nature. What we need is instead of miracles, we need to, we need to change the nature. And so that's why mitzvahs are meant to be hard and expensive and difficult and sometimes, hopefully not, but sometimes stressful and all these things. So let me just share a little bit more on the screen now that you understand a little bit more. Um, Moreover, even the preparations for a mitzvah must be accomplished in a natural manner. And then he quotes a story. Um, so again, let me, I'll skip the story because I'll explain the story in a second. From this, we can deduce that if a mitzvah is naturally associated with certain difficulties, whether they involve the mitzvah itself, its preparation, or its result, they should not be removed or lessened by miraculous means. Doing so will reduce what the mitzvah is supposed to accomplish. So the story goes like this, very fascinating story. I really like this line over here. If a mitzvah is naturally associated with certain difficulties, whether they involve the mitzvah itself, preparation, or its result. So the story goes like this. The story is that uh, the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, was imprisoned. We all know he was imprisoned um, for, uh, there was a slander against him. Some other Jewish groups did not like Hasidic philosophy at the time. They slandered against they slandered him in the government that he was sending money to Turkey, which was at war with, uh, with um, which was at war with uh, Russia at the time, and he wasn't actually sending money to Turkey. He was sending money to Israel to support the Jews in, in Israel, which was under Turkish Empire. But they figured out a way to claim he was supporting the Turkish Empire. Okay. So he was imprisoned, and there's lots and lots of stories during his imprisonment, as you can imagine, a very holy person in prison. Um, you'll have quite a few stories. In fact, by the way, the only reason we have a picture or a painting of the altar of the first Chabad Rebbe is because he was in prison. When he was in prison, they made a painting of him as a prisoner. So the story goes like this. Um, one time he was being transported, the, the, the prisons were on islands. He was being transported from one area of the prison to another, imagine Alcatraz, on a boat. And uh, he was out of his cell, very nice. And not only that, it was the time of the month where you could sanctify the moon. Um, for those who don't know, um, we know that in days of old, when there was a new moon, the Bet in the high court would sanctify the moon. They would say it's a new month. 
uh, called Rosh Chodesh, they would sanctify the new month. Uh, today, we don't have the, the court doing it for us, but nevertheless, every month when there's a new moon, when we can see the new sliver of the moon growing uh, in the beginning of the Hebrew month, we go out and we say some special prayers and we, what's called sanctifying the moon, Kiddush Levana, sanctifying the moon. So the Alter Rebbe was on the boat. Now there's a law, when you pray, ideally, you should be in one place. You shouldn't be moving when you're praying. So the Alter Rebbe is on this boat. He looks up, he sees there's a moon and he turns to the warden or the, or the guy driving the ship, this little boat. And he says, can you stop the boat? I wanna pray. So he says, no, you're a prisoner. I'm not stopping the boat. Well, don't play around with holy people. Shortly thereafter, the boat stopped of its own accord, stopped moving. No matter what he would try and do, it was stuck. Uh, the officer realized uh, what was going on. And then the Alta Rebbe, then, then the boat started moving again for no apparent reason other than miraculous means. And then again, the Alter Rebbe asked, can I pray the holy prayers of sanctifying the moon? And this time the guy said, yes, I'll, I'll stop the boat so you can pray, but give me a blessing, I'll live a long life. And, and he gave him a blessing and he lived a long life. And there's another story associated with that. The question is, if the Alter Rebbe was able to stop the boat supernaturally, right, which he did the first time, why didn't he make the prayer when he stopped the boat supernaturally? Why did he first stop the boat, let it go again, and then at, ask him to stop it and then make the prayer? And the answer is based on what we're saying over here, is that mitzvahs should not be performed in supernatural manners. Mitzvahs have to, okay, we, we don't have the ability to do supernatural. The altar have had the ability, but mitzvahs are supposed to be done within nature. They're supposed to be done within the day-to-day -day grind, within natural means. And that's why the altar Rebbe did not want to say a prayer based on a miracle. He wanted to say a prayer based on something that cost him. You know, so for, exa if for example, I were to give an example. If miraculously, you would get a $100 bill vaporized in your hand. You shouldn't go out with it and go buy a little of an etro. It's got to be money that's yours. And so taking this lesson to us, if mitzvahs were easy, then we would not necessarily be permeating the physicality of the world. In other words, a mitzvah without any effort is actually lacking. So if we want to know, do we have to work hard to do a mitzvah? The answer is yes, because it's the effort involved in the mitzvah that allows us to permeate the mitzvah and allow the spirituality to permeate the natural object. And, then, and, and so in order for mitzvah to permeate nature, it has to be done in a natural manner. And naturally, it's not easy. Now I'm gonna share with you a very fascinating uh, section from the Zohar. The Zohar is the classic book of Kabbalah uh, uh, written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai over 2000 years ago. And he says such powerful words that when you read it, you'll feel like, oh my gosh, I never want, I never want to do easy mitzvah again. So let's read what he says. Very powerful. It's written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And he says like this, the Zohar states that mitzvot should not be performed in an empty way for free, as then the mitzvah will not draw down a spirit of holiness. This behavior recalls the Egyptian lifestyle where as the verse states, we were given food for free. Rather, we must invest effort as necessary, consistent with our abilities, and pay the full amount. It was told that the Arizal would not negotiate over the price of the mitzvah. He would pay whatever he was asked of him. Similarly, the Talmud relates that Rabbi Gamliel purchased an esrog for a thousand gold coins. And so what this is saying here is if you perform a mitzvah in an empty way, it comes too easy. You don't want to spend money on it. You want everybody else to do uh, whatever it is. You will not draw down a spirit of holiness into it. If you want to draw down... He gives an example. When the Jewish people were in the desert, they kept saying, we want to go back to Egypt where we ate for free. And the commentator said, what do you mean you ate for free in Egypt? You were, you were slaves in Egypt. And the answer, they were free of mitzvahs. But the idea is that um, people like a free life, do what I want, when I want, how I want. Uh, but freebies don't work. Freebies don't work in the world. 
right? People who win the lottery don't uh, end up holding on to that money for a long time. And freebies don't work in uh, Judaism either. If it's too easy, it's a problem. And here there's an even more fascinating section of the Zohar. So before I tell you this next section, which is a continuation, which I said will make you really not want to um, do mitzvahs too easy. Uh, there's a person called Ashmedai. Anybody here ever heard of Ashmedai? Ashmedai? Now, Ashmedai is known as the king of demons. Many people don't know Judaism does believe in demons. Demons are spoken about in the Talmud at length. There are many customs we do today because of demons. <clears throat> now, you can ask, if there's demons, why don't we see them? That's a discussion for another time, uh, which we can, it's probably be a fascinating thing, but uh, we could spend a lot of time discussing demons. But um, regardless, Ashmedai was the king of demons. The Talmud discusses a lengthy story how King Solomon employed Ashmedai to help him accomplish a couple things. And then the Talmud later says Ashmedai got him back and took over the kingdom for a couple of years. A very fascinating story. Uh, regardless, um, Ashmedai taught King Solomon a couple things. And so here we're going to read from the Zohar something that Ashmedai, the king of demons, taught uh, King Solomon. So it says like this. Uh, let's start over here. Rabbi Shimon began expounding. If you wish to invest effort into a mitzvah and into your connection to God, do not do so with minimal effort or for free. Rather, invest proper effort consistent with your abilities. So far, so good. In the book of sorcery that Ashmedai taught to King Solomon, it is stated as follows. If you wish to invest effort into removing the spirit of impurity and compel another spirit, meaning the spirit of purity, to take its place, you must buy the item needed for the action you wish to do for its full price. Pay whatever they want you to pay, be it large or small, for the spirit of impurity always rests on what is free and empty and sold for no price. This spirit then dwells upon people against their will and seduces them to allow it to live alongside them. It uses many manipulative tactics to turn them away from the correct path and to allow it to dwell with them. And I, I think, by the way, you don't have to like, putting the Zohar aside, you can see that today where uh, freebies bring freebies. Uh, people who don't want to work, uh, they kind of get stuck in it. Um, it's a spirit of impurity, so to speak. And it, it grabs hold of them, doesn't want to let go. Um, and, and Ashmedai says, I love it. I love it. When people want to be lazy, I love it. Laziness is where I, I get to stick around. If you want to kick me out, if you want to kick the spirit of impurity out of something, you need to invest effort. That's the way to, to, to get rid of, um, to get rid of the spirit of impurity. Um, but now I'm going to ask why. So we understand that God wants us to permeate the physical world of spirituality. So therefore, our mitzvahs need to be done in natural means. And if you do a mitzvah in an easy way, if it's too easy, you're not going to bring a spirit of spirituality into it. But why does God make it so hard? So we said, well, just as natural life is hard. So if, if Judaism is supposed to permeate nature, it's going to be hard. Well, why does nature have to be hard? And here we go back to the original uh, uh, interesting text that I showed you in which we asked, uh, you know, God loves circumcision. Why wasn't Adam created circumcised? And the answer was, well, just as beans need to be cooked and wheat needs to be gr ground, uh, the mitzvah is not going to come easy. Well, and I asked, what was the meaning of that line? What's the meaning of saying, what's the, like, okay, so, so just as, uh, you know, this is hard, that's like, what's the connection? The answer is really, it's actually a very powerful connection. Why does God make it that we need to cook the beans? Why does God make it we need to make the wheat? Because God wants us to be partners in what he's doing. When something comes to you as a gift, you are a receiver. You're not a partner. You're not, you are not part of the action. You are just there receiving, accepting, getting it, but it doesn't have much to do with you. It's what's called in the Zohar and other places, the bread of embarrassment. Anything that you don't work on it was called bread of embarrassment. In other words, um, people, we naturally appreciate things that we worked on. 
it says a person would rather a smaller house that came from their own effort than a larger house that came for free. We see this all the time. People who win the lottery, I mentioned this earlier, people who win the lottery all the time, they win this big money, they've been dreaming about it for their life, and then they blow it so quickly. Why do they blow it so quickly? Because that money is what's called bread of embarrassment. They were not partners in that money. They were just receivers. They were not partners in, in creating that money. It just came to them. And if it comes to you, um, you're not a partner. You're just a receiver. And um, ultimately, it's not going to change who you are and what you are. And it's not going to change the world around you. And so now we can really get back to why are mitzvahs so hard? Mitzvahs are so hard because we need to elevate the world around us. God created a world that needs more spirituality in it. God created a world in which um, naturally life is tough, life is hard, and that includes Judaism. And so naturally, uh, spirituality is not obviously natural to the world, although it is hidden naturally through it, but it's not obviously natural. And by us doing the mitzvahs, we become partners in God's work. Just as when we take those beans and we cook them, you know, it actually says even Adam and Eve, right? We know Adam and Eve, they were in the Garden of Eden. You'd say they're in the Garden of Eden. It says in the Garden of Eden, everything was growing there by itself. They could, they could eat and drink. They had all the trees. They could eat all the trees except for the trees of knowledge and life, right? They could eat everything. Even then it says when Adam and Eve were put in the Garden of Eden, what, what does the Torah say? Why were they put there in the Garden of Eden? La'avda ula shamra. They were put there to work and to guard it. Again, Adam and Eve, born in a utopian place in the world. Even they were born to work. It says, Adam la'amal yivaleid. A person is born to work. Um, we're not meant to receive in this life free. Life is meant to work, to create. Because if you don't work, if it's not toil, you're not creating something. It was just there for you. Imagine you did a mitzvah. It was easy. You didn't create the mitzvah. It was there for you. You did nothing. This explains a very interesting line in Pirkei Avot, Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers, um, the classic comment that the, the, it's from the Mishnah, but it's the morals of Judaism. And it says a very interesting line. It says, whoever accepts upon themselves the yoke of heaven, the yoke of the world will be removed from them. And whoever removes from themselves the yoke of heaven, the yoke of the world will be put upon them. So what does it mean? Is it like God punishing is God saying, well, if you don't study, I'm going to make your life hard. And if you do study, I'll make life easier. No, what it's saying is we are born in this world to work. And if you're not going to work on this, you're going to work on that. Life is not meant to be easy. And honestly, it isn't for most people. It's not easy. But we do have a choice. Although it's not easy to keep the religion always, but in a sense, and I spoke about it on Shabbos also, Noah, the Ark. When we do keep our religion, it does bring us a certain inner peace. And although it's hard to do it, it also makes our lives easier in a certain way. We don't feel the, the, the worldly pressure as much. Uh, yeah, it's tough to keep the Torah mitzvot, but in a sense, the yoke of the world is removed from upon us because we're creating in this world in a different way and more uh, creating the bond between the physical and the spiritual. And so we as human beings, God created this world naturally. It's not created perfect. Circumcision, God did not create us born circumcised. God did not create beans already cooked. God, you know, again, I keep thinking, you know, today we don't understand that. Today we think microwaves come in the freezer and you stick them. Sorry, not microwaves. Dinners come in the freezer and you cook them in microwaves and voila, there's, 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 uh, there's the, uh, you know, there's, there's your dinner, right? It's the old joke. Right, the guy go, the, the Russian guy comes to America and he starts walking down the aisles and first he sees uh, mashed potato powder and he says, what's this? They say, oh, you take the mashed potato powder, you mix in water and uh, you get mashed potatoes. Then he comes to the next aisle and he, he sees uh, another powder. He says, what's this? They say, oh, this is milk powder. You mix, uh, you mix this powder with, with uh, some water and it becomes milk. Then he comes to the third aisle and he starts screaming and they, 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 they come running to him and say, what's the problem? He says, oh, I saw baby powder. So... Um, that's, it. That's the old joke. So we, we, we tend to think that everything in life comes easy. Yeah, it just comes easy. It's, it, it, it's, and, and society today makes us feel like that. And uh, that everything should be easy. And uh, a lot of the discussion today also in, in today's society is um, all about how, you know, how much should we be giving people? And I'm not going to get into 
social safety nets and whatnot. But I do know I actually read a letter this week um, where um, someone was, you know, writing to the Rebbe, you know, should they really work when they could rely on government benefits? And the Rebbe said, uh, people, you're created to work and you're created to, to earn a living, not to just uh, receive and receive. And how opposite is that to, to today? So many kids uh, still sitting in their parents' basements, uh, playing video games and doing DoorDash once in a while, you know? If you can get by in life, well, let me just get by. Let me get by in life. Let me see if I could uh, get a little bit farther. But most of us here, I think, on this call, we've all worked hard in life, I think. And uh, I'm preaching to the choir over here a little bit. Um, but what I'm trying to present really is just as you understand that that applies in life, where life is not meant to be easy. And now I'm explaining to you why. It's not meant to be easy because we're meant to be partners with God. When it's not easy, when it's not a handout, when we have to finish that creation, we become partners in God's work. And so we being the partners of God, that applies also in the mitzvahs. God's not going to make it easy because then we're not partners. Then God is doing all the work. Now, I want to finish off with, um, well, I always say I finish off. I don't think rabbis ever finish off. So I'm, I'll say I have two more things to finish off with. Um, even though I, I've discussed in this class the importance of putting in work and putting in hard work at evening, Rick, and, and the importance of putting in hard work, nevertheless, I'm not trying to say that it always has to be so hard. Clinia, good to see you. I'm not saying it always has to be so hard. Um, but effort has to be there. Let me read you the story over here. A very interesting story. So let's read the story. This is from the Medrash. And the Medrash tells the story of Rabbi Hanina Ben Dosa. Rabbi Hanina Ben Dosa was one of the rabbis of the Talmud. Uh, he's famous for a lot of different things, but he also uh, wasn't very wealthy. So the story goes like this. Let's read it here. Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa saw people in a city bringing sacrifices to Jerusalem. There was the holy temple. So you saw this one had a cow, this one had a deer. Oh, deer, no. Uh, a, a goat, whatever. What's The deers were not offered in the, in the temple. Um, it's just, he said, um, I don't think so, at least. And... Um, yeah, not all kosher animals were brought, in, were brought in the temple. Very few people know that technically giraffe is also kosher, but uh, I don't think we ever really... Uh, anyways, um, she says, everyone is bringing sacrifices to Jerusalem and I won't do so as... And I won't do so as well. So he didn't know what to do. He didn't have money to buy a sacrifice. So he found a stone and chipped it and chiseled it and polished it and said, now I must transport it to Jerusalem. So he didn't have money. So he said, let me go find something for free. What's, what's more free than a big rock? So he took this rock, he made it look all nice, but now he has to bring it to uh, Jerusalem. He, it's very heavy. He decided to hire laborers. I don't know if he had the money to hire laborers. Suddenly, five people appeared. Will you transport the stone to Jerusalem for me? He asked them. They said, pay us five salayim, which is not a lot of money, and we will transport it to Jerusalem. He wanted to pay them, but having no money at the time, he sent them away. So he couldn't afford people to carry his rock. So Hashem brought five angels with the appearance of men. Will you transport the stone to Jerusalem for me? He asked them, pay us five salam and we will transport it to Jerusalem with the condition that you help us out with a hand and a finger. So he placed his hand and finger on the stone and found himself standing in Jerusalem. He wanted to pay them, but could no longer find them. He entered the Lishkat to Gazet in the temple and inquired about the laborers. I was told apparently heavenly angels transported your stone to Jerusalem. So it's an interesting story. So first workers came to him and said, pay us. He couldn't pay them. Then angels came and said, pay us. Well, he didn't answer them, but they said, first, put your hand on the rock. In other words, you help us carry it. The moment he put his hand on the rock to join them in lifting up the rock and helping them move it, he became part of the effort. Then the miracle happened and the rock was transported to Jerusalem. But till he lifted a finger to lift the rock and move it, nothing was going to happen to that stone. Very interesting story. You asked, if God was going to do a miracle, just have the angels move the rock without him touching it, without him trying to move it. But no, God wants us to do the effort. Sometimes when we put in the effort, God will give us the miracles. He'll make the path smooth like he did to Rabbi Hanina Ben Dosa. Sometimes 
will have to put in a lot of effort. What I'm trying to say is that sometimes the effort will be more, sometimes the effort will be less. But one thing is consistent, we will always need to put in effort. We pray and we can pray to God to make it easier. We can pray to God to make it that there should be less effort involved. That it should be a little bit easier. But we have to play with what God gives us. We put in the effort and then we see what happens next. But we need to put in that effort. And um, as uh, the Rebbe points out, that um, you know, you know, let me let me read this final thing over here. This is one of the uh, in the seventies. It was the Rebbe made a campaign that there are twelve uh, lines every person should say every day. Twelve lines every specifically children, but twelve lines every single person should say a day. Six of them were verses from the Torah, and six of them were statements of our sages, and some of those being from the Tanya. And one of those 12 included is this one over here. Very interestingly, the Rebbe considered this one of the 12 lines that a child would say every day. Rabbi Yitzchak said, if a person says to you, I have labored and not found success, do not believe him. Similarly, if he says to you, I have not labored, but nevertheless, I have found success, do not believe him. If, however, he says to you, I have labored and I have found success, believe him. In other words, that's how life is going to be. If you're successful and you didn't work, you're not really successful. If you did work and you weren't successful, you probably didn't work enough. But if you work and you're successful, that's what God wants. And this is a line the Rebbe wanted to tell children. You want to get somewhere in life. You, you're in your studies. You want to study. You want to move. You want to change your character. It doesn't come easy. You don't get it by, by, by playing video games. You have to work. You have to. Uh, it's not going to come easy. And we don't always know where God is leading us to. But effort has to be involved. So to answer our question, why is... Um, Judaism so expensive or why is it not always so easy because God wants us to put in that effort he wants to make it difficult or natural shall I say because if we have to put in the effort then we become partners with God in uh this vital work of making this world a spiritual place I want to end off with a story and maybe this I'll really end off with but I'm not sure oh I had two more stories sorry uh, just a related story to that last one it's also told a, an interesting story. Uh, well, we know the famous, well, you know, we know when the Jewish people wanted to cross the Red Sea, right? When the Jewish people came to the Red Sea, the Egyptians were behind them, the water was in front of them. How did the water of the sea split? So the Torah says that uh, Moses held up a staff and it pulled the water out. But the Midrash tells us an, an additional story. Does anybody know the story from the Midrash? Someone else was instrumental in the splitting of the sea. Anybody knows? So the Midrash tells us that there was a person called Nachshon ben Aminadav. Nachshon, the son of Aminadav. And he jumped into the water. He said, God told us to travel. There's an ocean here. Okay, there's an ocean. But God told us to travel. Travel we will. And he starts walking through that ocean or sea. And it gets up and it gets up and it gets up to his nose. And that's when the sea split. And our, our, the Midrash tells the same thing happened with Abraham. When Abraham wanted to offer his son as a sacrifice, it said the Satan appeared to Abraham as a river blocking his way. He had to go to a very specific mountain. He saw a river. There was no way to cross it. And so Abraham said, all right, I'm going through it. And he started walking through that river. And the moment it says it came up to his nose, and I guess Abraham didn't know how to swim or whatnot, or maybe it was tumultuous, um, the river disappeared. Satan had no more power. And so that's really what it's about, is God wants us to put in the effort. And sometimes when we put in the effort, we'll have those miracles like Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. Sometimes when we put in that effort, sometimes, yes, maybe you'll, you'll say you don't want to work on Shabbos, and then out of that, eventually will come, you'll get a bonus or you'll get a raise. Many times that's, that's what happens. So it's tough in the beginning, but that doesn't mean that God will not bless you or reward you at the end. And I want to finish off with a modern day story that really brings out that idea 
that although things can be difficult in the beginning, um, they can end up very, very special. So um, there's anybody here ever heard of Tamir Goodman? Tamir Goodman? I think he came to speak by us many years ago. I'm not sure. Tamir Goodman um, was a basketball player, is a basketball player in Israel. I think we showed a video of him recently. Um, the Sports Illustrated once made this big article about him called the Jewish Jordan. And they had a pictures of him with Tefillin and Talis. They made this whole write-up on him, this, this guy who keeps Shabbos. Um, nice article, but after the article, he still had trouble finding a college to play in. College games are typically played on uh, the Sabbath. So he was a, a Shabbos observant Jew. He's not gonna, he's not gonna play in a college on the Shabbos. Well, um, he uh, was first accepted to a large college program. They promised him they wouldn't play on Shabbos and then they changed their mind. And so then he ended up going to a very small college and he had many, many stories on the college campus how, how despite it being so difficult to keep Shabbos, his fellow teammates respected him and honored him so much. And, um, and uh, the commitment that he had to keeping Shabbos. But um, long story short, he was in college, I think one year, maybe two years. And then uh, there came in another coach who he says was not very friendly to Jews. And he didn't make the program work with him anymore. Okay, you have to work with it if you want him to not work on the Shabbos, you know, winter games where you can play Saturday night or something like that. And um, so Tamir ended up leaving America and moving to Israel because he couldn't hack the basketball with his Shabbos. The end of the story is so you'd say terrible. He, you know, he lost at college, lost at his NBA career. He was like one of the top 25 players. Um, well, in Israel, he met his, ultimately he met his Kala, his bride. And his bride was actually a, a, a nice Jewish girl who was a track runner. And again, she would not uh, run on Shabbos. And for that reason, she couldn't hack it in America and she had to come to Israel. And so because both of these people and their commitments to um, Shabbat, they ended up in Israel and they met in Israel and they ended up marrying and having a bunch of wonderful children together. And so the lesson from the story is, okay, he never became uh, the Jewish Jordan. He didn't make it to the NBA. I think he's still wealthy enough. I think he played in the Israeli leagues. Um, I think he's doing okay. But he's had the ultimate happiness in his life. He met his wife, and his wife met him, and uh, they live, hopefully, for many, many more years, happily ever after. And so that's really what I think today is about. Judaism is not easy. God doesn't make it easy. But I think also the flip side to that is, although it's meant to be hard, it's also beautiful. And God gives us uh, those moments where we do that effort, we lift up that rock, and that rock is transported to Jerusalem. And so may we all become partners with God. May we all put in a lot of effort into our Judaism. May we all spend a lot of money at the synagogue. No, I'm kidding. Let us all, um, as, as, uh, you know, um, buy an expensive little of an etrog. Okay, whatever it is in life that you need to put in more effort in your Judaism, put in that extra effort, um, be a partner with God. And we'll all be partners with God. We will all soon ultimately bring the Mashiach. May come very speedily in our days and we'll all touch that rock and find ourselves poof in Jerusalem. Uh, one last thing before I sign off here. We're going to now pick up doing the Wednesday night classes. So we're going to have classes every Wednesday night. Um, so next week topic not yet decided yet, but in two weeks, we're starting a JLI course called um, Outsmarting Anti-Semitism. So it's, of course, a four-week course on anti-Semitism and how we have to start outrunning anti-Semitism and how we have to start outsmarting it. So you'll want to join that course, a JLI course, and uh, please look for the email, the sign-up link for that. I will also be offering the class uh, on an alternate date for people who need uh, to do daytime. I think I'm going to do it both on Wednesday twice, both at lunchtime and then in the evening. So if, for somebody, lunchtime works better. And uh, hopefully you all can make it for that. And we'll see you next week. I'll stick around for questions and I'm going to sign off on Facebook.